Good evening and welcome to Ganesh Shot. What? Good evening. Uh, as you see, uh, I'm here with Brigadier Arun Sagal, and we're going to talk about. the emerging global order the problems within it and what constitutes a favorable strategic balance for india jaise hum sab ko pata hai ki duniya mein jo chitra hai wo badal raha hai ukraine mein ladai ho raha hai gaza mein iran israel aur gaza ke beech mein bhi ghamasan ladai ho raha hai iran iraq ka ईरान और सॉरी इसराइल का शुरू हो गया साउथ चाइना से में कष्ट है चाइना के लिए कभी भी वहां लड़ाई चिड़ सकता है अगर आप यूएसए और चाइना का संबंध देखेंगे बहुत तनाव है बहुत दोनों कोशिश कर रहे हैं कि आगे कैसे बढ़ाएं चाइना का अर्थव्यवस्था डाउन हो रहा है हम बात कर रहे हैं I mean, लगातार हम बात कर रहे हैं उसके बारे में रशिया कभी स्थिति कुछ लोग बोलते हैं सही है कुछ लोग बोलते हैं लड़कड़ा रहा है और रशिया और चाइना का गठबंधन भी बढ़ रहा है उस हालत में इंडिया का क्या होगा इंडिया के लिए व्हाट इज द फेवरेबल बैलेंस व्हिच वी नीड ऑल दिस वी नीड अ लॉट ऑफ इंट्रोस्पेक्शन और खास करके उस वक्त पे जब हमारा इलेक्शन चल रहा है और एक नया गवर्नमेंट आने वाला है और एक नया गवर्नमेंट के साथ चाहे वो, वो पुराना पार्टी का क्यों ना हो एक नया दिशा चाहिए और एक नया सोच चाहिए राइट एंड एज इंडिया इज राइजिंग थिंग्स आर गोइंग चेंज तो ये है बेसिक एडिफिस ऑन विच आई वुड रिक्वेस्ट ब्रिगेड साइकिल सर योर व्यूज यू मे टेक ओवर थैंक यू वेरी मच uh jal shankar it's always a pleasure to be on your channel and today we are talking about emerging strategic balances globally and their impact on india and how should india shape its own equations on the eve of the elections and when we are going to see a forming of a new government in the early part of june fundamental point we need to understand is this that the world is in disarray It is facing multiple wars. There is a war in Ukraine, which is a never-ending war in Ukraine. There is a continuing war in Gaza, which is expanding slowly but surely. And there is a negative strategic balance emerging, owing to contestation between two big powers, that is China and the United States in the Indo-Pacific. So the issue basically is this: is what are the main drivers? the first point i want to highlight is this is that united states ever since the cold war has been involved in multiple wars for the last 23 years united states has been involved in multiple wars which have touched 80 countries and they are continuing the these wars are based on various rationals and logics one logic is their economic and technological contestations like we are seeing against china there is a military contestation which we are seeing in europe and now we are seeing it extended into the middle east then there is a global war on terrorism which has continued for the last 23 years and another element that is now emerging is particularly in the context of ukraine is the proxy contest to keep arming a nation till there are no soldiers left in that country and who fighting on your behalf for 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 logics and rationals which i have just come to in a while 
So before I go to this, let me highlight to you how is the global order is looking at this point in time. May I have the first slide, sir? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, if you look at this order, uh, there are multiple colors, which is not easy to see. No, no problem, sir. We'll show it okay. like this. Okay. So, if you see, the United States is a is a continental power, which is in one part of the world and has no acrimonious borders. It has relationships and partnerships with Europe. And this area from the United States to Europe or Atlantic Union is the, is the centrality of the NATO construct, which is trying to influence events in Europe and put time to maintain a balance of power over there. The next area of the US influence is used to be the Middle East, but ever since Biden came, they try to pull out of Middle East, left it to the to the region. They try to create new alliance systems in Middle East. But by and large, the United States has now come back as a concept, as a rational of the Gaza conflict. The third area where the United States is present and a strong presence is in the Indo-Pacific on the what, are, what is normally called is the Western Pacific and Northeast Asia, this area. This area is the logic and the rationale for the Chinese, uh, for the Americans to ensure that the, United, the its main peer competitor, China, cannot extend its power and influence beyond continental Asia. The, the main reasons for the United States to use its power and influence is to ensure that the unipolarity of the American power, influence, control over multiple multilateral organizations and in the sense to be a driver of the global commerce world order and ensure that whatever realignments take place, they do not impact United States interests. Challenging them is what I call dragon bear, China and Russia. China is a peer competitor. United States national security strategy clearly indicates China as a, a peer competitor who has to be cooperated, contained, and if you cannot contain it, it can lead to a conflict. So the three tier three C strategy is what the United States is following, vis-a-vis -vis the Chinese are concerned. But China and Russia are now coming together to essentially take control over or to, to enhance its influence starting from Eastern Europe all the way to Eurasia and from Eurasia right up to the Pacific. Now, this, in this construct, what needs to be understood is this, is that the while the United States is a 27 or 26 trillion dollar economy, the Chinese are also a strong economy, which has a great influence in Asia. As everybody understands, the, the engine of growth, the area where the maximum growth is going to take place, an area which is going to be the most contested is the Indo-Pacific. And this is this area in the continental domain that the Chinese are controlling. And with Russia coming in, in uh, 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 along with them, they are having to, they have a control over the entire continental space and slowly and steadily are now pushing into the maritime domain. So this is the, this is where the issue is, logic is come about. 
China and Russia are not only together. There is a sign of emergence of a new coalition of interests. And that coalition of interests is now based on Iran, China, Russia, and North Korea. And if you see this coalition of interests, although it it it, it provides the 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 two the dragon and bear and access into the Persian Gulf, it provides access into the Northeast Asia, and also supports their interests in the Middle East. So if you notice that the war is more or less getting joined around in this region. So when we are looking at this, what are the basic issues that are emerging out of this? First part we have to understand is the general belief in both camps that global order is undergoing systemic transformation, outcomes of which are unpredictable, with variety of unforeseen implications. The second major issue is the contest between these two groups is inevitable. Nature is to be determined and it will depend on how the two sides are consolidating and projecting their power and influence. So we see every day Taiwan issue coming up. We see every day uh, China, Europe, and China, America contestation on technology and and global uh, trade uh, emerging. We see realignment of, of of forces taking place in 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 the Indo-Pacific. So these are the important issues which we need to look at to deal with this this whole scenario. And as we must understand is, as a major global power, a, a power that has, that has by and large ruled the world since the Second World War, the United States is not keeping quiet. It is rearming itself, is recalibrating itself, and it is developing new power alignments and in the, in the region. It, what we can see that in what is known as AUKUS, this alignment taking place in this part of the world. We see what is happening in IMAC, and we see also in I2U2. The whole idea is global connectivities and trade. The area which is still United States and this alliance are weak is Africa or the global south. As far as Europe is concerned, that is an area of concern for the United States. The European alliance system is weak, is economically weak, is politically weak, is strategically weak. And their ability to sustain the war in Ukraine, particularly in the context of, of Russia trying to incrementally getting an upper hand, is becoming a problem for the United States. So this is this is the situation. That, that is available. As far as China and Russia are concerned, they have two, three aims. First is, there is a belief, particularly in China, that the party led system is much better and, and in delivering social, economic, and development goals to its people. Second is that they are very clear that U.S. global influence has to be contested and contained, particularly in areas of their interest. And like I said, the areas of interest are Ukraine. So Ukraine becomes a centerpiece because Russia has to be defeated to ensure that uh, the, there is a strategic stability in Europe. Now, if Russia is not defeated, and if Russia is able to ensure or push for even, even I would say, uh, an end state where it dominates the, the post-2014 
conflict environment, the that will have a serious repercussions on the uh, uh, urban security. Similarly, in the in the West Asia, there is this if this alignment of of Iran supported by these two other powers and with the regional proxies are able to mount a challenge to Israel, then the problem occurs is that how are these new alignments going to shape the regional order. It is very clear that there is a difference in views between the, the Gulf and the Arabs, uh, the, uh, the, the Palestinians and, the, uh, and their supporters in the region. The, uh, the, the Saudis, the Jordanians, the UAE uh, and most of the GCC countries are very keen to keep leave this war fighting behind, consolidate economically because they understand that the oil as a resource is not is going is not going to last long, and this is this, this is a finite resource, and they have to move forward and develop new capacities, new capabilities like the Vision 2030 of the Saudi Arabia, which they're trying to import. So, the, so, the, so, so this dynamics is being played at a multiple levels. So I'll stop here. If you have any questions, I will then come back to you. Yes, sir. I think uh, there are some questions. And first of all, we know that China and Russia together are trying to for, I mean, change the global order. There are two rights in And in which America will not have a say. But someone else will have a say. Okay. The question is, first question in this is, who is this someone? Though they are trying to change the global order, the replacement of this global order, will it be by China or Russia? That's the question. Or, I mean, in history of the world, there has been no joint you know, effort at changing this global order. That's why one. And therein okay. lies the contradiction of this whole story. Okay, the 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 it's an excellent question. My short answer to this question basically is this: that this contestation is likely to continue for some time, and there is no clarity on the end result, end state. That it's going to be a multifaceted uh, this thing with moving goalposts. But we have to understand one thing that where why there is a white man's alignment or a Western alignment, particularly in values, in terms of their interests between the United States and the European powers. China and Russia are aligned by circumstances. Now, what shape those circumstances take place will be a critical element. Now, take a scenario in which Russians and impose a favorable end state on Ukraine, it captures territory, makes Ukraine as a, as a neutral uh, uh, country, and which is acceptable by all. And United States, purely in the, but maybe under the Trump administration, goes back into the continental US. And he says, we are too overextended. We have been fighting wars for the last 24 years. We, are, we have had enough. There is no reason why we cannot live peacefully with Russia. Then the question arises is this, is what happens to the Chinese? The fundamental point we have to understand is this, is while the China, Russian contestation with the West is Eurocentric, and not Asia centric, the, you know, the contestation between United States and China is Indo Pacific centric. And that Indo Pacific centric contestation is this key to this whole game. Because until and unless that contestation has a positive outcome, particularly for the Chinese. China will always remain a major global player, but a restrained global player operating in, 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 in the sphere of what I call coercion and gray zone operations 
in Asia, but never been able to project its power and influence. And its power right. and influence will be constrained. Uh, I think you put it very nicely, sir. As you have put it, let me extend this. Okay. You know, like you said, like likely Trump administration. What will what will be what will the likely Trump administration do? If it is the, uh, Biden coming back, this whole story will continue the way it is. If Trump comes, look at the scenario where he pulls out from Ukraine and comes to a decision, right, with Russia, when it comes to some kind of a uh, you know terms with Russia. But the likelihood of his doing so with China very poor. In fact, he'll be more China centric, right? That is the thing. Then, then where does this leave? Because virtually you're going to uh, China will be the center of uh, all uh, contestation or conflict or whatever you want, and Russia will get its piece. Okay, so that's what is likely to pan okay, out. Okay, okay. As far as Trump administration is concerned, in my view, they will go to first principles. The first principle basically is this, that Europe is suffering because of Ukraine. This war has, is of no value. And even if the war ends favorably, it will remain a, a, a simmering contest and it will only be uh, or continue to fester on the security metrics, which will have a large scale implications for Europe. So, for the Trump administration or, or the new administration, other than the Biden administration, whoever comes, Trump administration, the dumbing down of Ukraine conflict and reaching some kind of a negotiated settlement with Russia. Uh, would be their first option. The sec the, the reason for that is very simple, is that the road to Chinese global power projection goes through its control over Indo-Pacific. And, and more specifically, the Asia-Pacific, or that is ASEAN, East Asia, yes. etc., etc. Now, if the Americans are forced to withdraw or Americans are contested and contained in the region and China becomes a major domo, that would mean that the American power and influence now rests only in Europe and in the continental US, which nobody is touching, it's too far away. And, and with that, the, there will be a much bigger upheaval in terms of realignments of power, particularly in global south. People looking, the, 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 the Europeans also trying to look at how to mend fences with China. Right now, we see there is a huge amount of, of, of uh, bullying of China being done by European Union in terms of uh, starting uh, 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 these. Uh, uh, Against electronic vehicles and its solar panel, yes, uh, the tariffs, a lot of tariff wars, good. tariff wars, uh, etc. So, so bottom line basically is this: is that China uh, uh, then will have a much bigger space. Please understand that if that also happens, the ASEAN countries, the Chinese neighbors, as well as countries like Korea, will fall into the lap of the Chinese. Japan will continue to fight it out, but Japan will be then will be a, a, a lone power. And Japan, when push comes to shove, I don't think Japanese are capable of withstanding the, uh, the Chinese uh, missile and other attacks uh, or, or, or let's say intimidating tactics they will follow. And, and uh, so, so if the uh, Americans are pushed beyond the second island chain, then this whole ball game will change. So the, yes, as far as the United States is concerned, the contestation and the balance of power in Indo-Pacific is central to
to American Juniper influence globally. The, the same issue is now emerging in the in the in West Asia, where again the realignments of power, and there again we see two trend lines taking place is that uh, Turkey, who's a who's a partner, uh, NATO partner, NATO countries, is now pushing towards a, a new uh, alignment of a of, of a new uh, alignment of uh, where they're talking to connect Turkey through Iraq to, uh, to Syria to Iraq and on to Iran uh, yeah. as a new transportation corridor which comes to the uh, Persian Gulf. Anyway. Huh? No, it's the Persian Gulf. It's, it's, they're pushing it very hard. They, it's, yes, it's yes, a yes, yes. alternative because they are saying that IMAC is a dead issue. So, you know, so and then we are also seeing what is happening is that the Saudis are also investing heavily in China. See where the money is. That's where the money is. The Chinese. Yeah, they, you, they you follow the trail, money trails. So, so the question basically is, and the Russians are also with us. There are some, there are unrelated reports which are, of course, there were some. The thing is that the Russians had warned the Iranians about the Israelis taking off with the nuclear weapon command post uh, during this uh, last bit of strikes on it. But it, I mean, it has not been. A, fully proved uh, through, through other sources but the point at issue is that the that the 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 like the jordanians and the saudis and the other uh, uh, the um, american partners uh, french and the british played a part uh, you can expect the similar part being played by the iranians and the uh, sorry chinese and the russians in the future conflict over here so so the, that basically means is that the uh, entire Middle Eastern space is going to remain contested. And that is where the whole issue comes about. And there is another element to that, is that the element of that is that with China and Russia and Iran undertaking joint exercises in the Persian Gulf and with the Houthis and, uh, and the Somalians uh, pushing the agenda in the in the Red Sea and controlling uh, and disrupting, not controlling, disrupting shipping over there. The ability of these countries to disrupt strategic economic trade along the sea lines of communications is very high. And we get directly involved into this. So this is an issue that we need to take cognizance of as we look at this balance of power equations. I completely agree with you, sir, that things are going to get even more complicated even if Trump comes. Uh, and they, of course, I have my views whether uh, this coalition will function. I mean, we are all talking of an emerging coalition of China, North Korea, Iran, and Russia, right? Whether this will function the way we think it will is a question mark. Interest based. Because it interest based, sir. It's not in anyone's interest to control. You see, uh, all of us think that look, once these people come into play with Houthis and things and the Somalian piracy and all, they can control the waterways or the choke points of uh, Babal Mandab and Strait of Hormuz. But if they control any of this, it is to China's detriment. Because it will equally affect China because China is already being affected by it. And China can't, China can ill afford its trade being disrupted. So to that extent, that it, that uh, argument itself becomes slightly tenuous. But you can't wish away that argument. It is there. I agree no, with you. No, I totally agree with you. No, I, But I just like to caution one thing, sir. And that is, keep a close watch on the timing and the manner in which the Iranians are pushing Pakistan for that pipeline. Now, well, let us see. Uh, uh, if that pipeline comes through and gets connected to the Pakistani grid, I done a great study on the Pakistani oil grids, then it will not be difficult for the Chinese to haul this Take oil uh, to up north. 
to Daryl Kaur. Up north, also, sir, again is a, uh, also uh, we also know that uh, there are new pipelines coming up in Kazakhstan to connect China, and also the the Trans Siberian pipeline, which has now been completed. So you know, it's it's while well, uh, it's important that these things are there, but it is much more critical for a country like us that is has is dependent totally on the energy flows by the sea. That's uh, the and that That's I, I am completely with you, uh, okay. because uh, you know, knowing where Pakistan is and how dependent Pakistan is on USA, whether that pipeline will be allowed to come up by USA is a question mark. Okay, so, so now we'll, can I move we'll leave the second part. Yeah, so we'll leave it there. We'll get to the second part. I'll get the second map up and then, oh, yeah, we'll okay. talk so of this. My, my next, part, next part is where does India fit into this global balance of power? Correct. I mean, that's the main issue. That's the, it, the logical thing. So, yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, can I have the next one, please? Yeah, yeah. Ah, okay. Uh, th this is just a huge map trying to explain to you the power dynamics in Asia. The red and the pinks are the areas, are zones of influence. Uh, they may not be totally to the scale. They and, and the blues okay, are the U.S. influences. And India, as you know, is a is a strategic partner, but it, which which is which has got uh, uh, power equations with both east and west. So India, India plays on both sides, but I'll come to that in a, in a moment. Okay, India has got four key strategic objectives. That's something which we need to look at. First objective is preserve internal unity and territorial integrity. Second is economic growth and development. Third is acquire advanced technologies and and capabilities. And third is emerge as a leading global power which has the potential of influencing global dynamics. I say again, it has the potential of influencing global dynamics. So when we look at India, areas of interest, we look at it in their areas of interest from three concentric circles. One is the inner ring, what is called the strategic neighborhood. The second is the outer ring, which links India to its aspirational areas of influence. And third is the global ring, which links India to major global players and institutions. When we look at the inner ring, it is apparent to everybody, and everybody knows this, that India in South Asia is partner to everybody, and none of the other states have got common borders. So India is the only country which connects all the South Asian players. But what is important for us to understand is this, is that India is a power, which is a non-expansionist power. We, are, we have tried to deal with our neighbors in a good neighborly sense and have never used power and influence to or coercion against them. The result unfortunately has been that on the West, we have a troublesome borders with Pakistan and a history of 75 years, which continues to adversely affect our security dynamics. The more important part of this is Pakistan is becoming a willing collaborator with China and asserting its influences on our borders. So it's not only Pakistan we have to deal with it, but we have to deal with China-Pakistan uh, uh, coalition of interest. And that is where the problem occurs. As we, as we, as people who keep track of things are aware, that the new road which they are trying to make through Karakaram Agil Highway yeah. uh, uh, Agil Pass, that's going through our territory and Shakskam Valley, which is given away by Pakistan to China uh, for grazing rights in, in, in the Hunza Valley. So, 
So what I am trying to make is this, that they have to take cognizance of this. As far as our other neighbors are concerned, Bhutan is our closest neighbor, but which is being pressurized by China for resolution of boundary. Resolution of boundary is one issue, but the Chinese basically want to open up consulate and bring Bhutan as an important strategic player and a partner by through inducements, aid, assistance, etc. The number of things that is happening in Bhutan, so which I, is not important for this discussion today, but it's important to say is that Bhutan is now becoming a key element of the Chinese regional strategy. And although Bhutan remains entirely uh, focused on India, the very fact that the Prime Minister had to go on the eve of elections to have a word with the king indicates its importance. The next area is Nepal. Nepal was a Hindu kingdom, now has become a secular state. But ever since the CPN Maoists and the UML and other people have come to power, they have started playing games. And here the interesting part lies is this, is China with its fat wallets, money is inducing China, Nepalese to become their uh, uh, proxies against India and create all kinds of problems for India. We have handled them. We are trying to handle them with a manner which we are best that we do through inducements, through discussions, to talking about our old relationship. But the fact of the matter is that in this balance of power game, we are not like the Chinese as coercive. And we have to somehow always play a second fiddle to their, their balancing issues. The similar story comes about in, in uh, Bangladesh. Now, Bangladesh is a country which we need to look at seriously. Although Sheikh Hasina is a, uh, is a close partner, but there are things happening in, this, uh, in, uh, in Bangladesh. There are new port facilities that are coming up. Now with the report of a dry dock coming up in, in, in those port facilities near Chittagong, there's a, I'm forgetting the name of the, the new port area. And where the Chinese are going to deploy their submarines for refit and uh, repair. So this is an important development. I mean, you could have Chinese, uh, uh, both SSNs and the uh, conventional submarines operating from this area is an issue that cannot but concern us. Similarly, we also see the uh, Sidhubay port and the area being developed uh, as major base. And and an area from where Chinese strategic resources are pumped up into the into the uh, southwestern China uh, in Yunnan. And the important part over here is this: is people forget the fact is that when you create strategic assets, you also bring securitization of those assets. Securitization of these assets becomes an important issue, and that comes with uh, hand in hand. And then we also have the problem issue with in, in Sri Lanka. So we need to ensure, we need to take our strategic neighborhood more seriously, ensure that it, it even if it not becomes our sphere of influence, it remains, it remains balanced in a fashion that it does not pose any threat to challenges or does not become a pawn in the hand of our incremental or our, 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 our uh, in the all hands of, of powers that are not against India. And we have a classic case of Maldives, uh, where uh, where this whole game is being played in front of our eyes. And we are seeing how the Chinese are gloating over the fact that uh, Ms. Mizu, whose party won 60% of the seats and have now become a uh, uh, majority party in the parliament, and therefore, that strengthens their position, et cetera, et cetera. And because, I mean, you have to see the location of motives along the sea lines of communication to understand this. So first and foremost, therefore, is again, the turmoil in Myanmar is, is, is hampering our, our, our eastward expansion. There is a trilateral highway which we are trying to build via Mandalay, linking up with, uh, with Thailand. Okay. That is... And that's not happening. I mean, happening is the work is slow. And there was another uh, port 
south of Sitwe, from where we were trying to make a link up uh, with Thailand, that too has not happened. So, you know, so the question is, uh, there is a sense of isolation and lack of credible influence emerging in our neighborhood. That's something which we need to go work upon. That's an important issue. We need to work seriously upon. The next ring I go to is the outer ring. The outer ring is, has to... May I have the map, please? Yes, sir. Uh, the outer ring has, has from Southeast Asia to the West Asia. That's our outer ring. This is our area of influence. One feeds us is our energy and resources. It's an area where we have worked very hard over the last 10 years to build up partnership relationships which are not based on only oil and, and uh, diaspora. But these are relationships are built on developing combined capacities, look, developing projects, investments, trade, and also developing corridors, which help connect us to Europe uh, and by, uh, uh, bypassing the constraints that I talked about earlier, the Red Sea and the others. So this is an area that is of, of critical importance. And it also helps us in dampening the effect of Islamic radicalism, which is being propagated against us by the Pakistanis. So this is an important area and we have invested very heavily in it and we would like to ensure that. They... So this brings us me to the point that if we are looking west, we have to have a good relationship with Iran. We have to have a good relationship with the Gulf states and we have to have a good relationship with Saudi Arabia. And we have been managing this well. The fact that we, how we leverage Qatar to release our people. We also have to also remember one thing is that while today the Russian oil has become a very cheap resource, but if you look at the figures, our majority of oil is still coming from Iraq, Saudi Arabia. And our gas is LNG is completely coming from Qatar. Qatar. So this is an area that we need to be very, very clear about. And this is that's why we are spending so much of resources, energy, and trying to build up new capacities and capabilities and interests and investments. Now coming to Southeast Asia, this is again an area of critical importance. Although the recent survey of the uh, ESA uh, that the Studies, Studies uh, uh, Institute uh, talked about very little understanding about India amongst the, uh, uh, the uh, important stakeholders in Southeast Asia, China and America rule the rules. But please understand this, that incrementally, as India's power and influence is growing, there are new supply chains coming up, new investments coming up, and there's a huge amount of interest. We have $150 billion plus trade with ASEAN. So this is an important area for us. And added to this area <clears throat> is our whole dy dynamics with China. And here, I'd like to highlight some points. The China issue or our, our basic our estrangement with China is the firm -ish aspect which provides us with a certain degree of alignment of interest. I'm using the word carefully, alignment of interest with the United States and its alliance partners in the Pacific and East Asia. And this alignment of interest with partners is, is, is a multi-dimensional alignment. It covers the technology, it covers economics, it covers trade, and it also covers military aspects. So, so what is important to us to understand is this, is that India has to remain connected with ASEAN 
and here there are there are important aspects we have reached out to philippines and we are building up strong military sales economic and trade partnerships with both philippines and vietnam we have not done that well vis-a-vis the indonesians because we there is a there is a perception amongst indonesians is that you know india is a big power but we we the india's ability to support this economic interest is limited etc 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 there is a work in place for us and similarly uh, uh, in malaysia but the point we have to understand is this india has to both economically technologically invest in asean and the countries around it uh, including korea and to a limited degree with japan japan is all in our important partners our relationship with russia uh, sorry australia are on the mend we have a huge in, uh, uh, convergences both in strategic and economic terms in fact the only country which we have i mean in the region we have a free trade area uh, is australia so if you look at in this the dynamic the the area of play for india in 2024 is going to be the these two areas that is west asia and south east asia extending up to the uh, quad countries uh, that is uh, uh, japan and australia so this brings me to the third uh, at the final uh, uh, circle that is the global circle and here the global balance of power is important for us united states is not only a consequential player it provides us a hedge against chinese dominance we 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 like it or we don't like it but this is an important issue is the same reason that relationship with india is provides a credibility to the strategic partnership to the united states please look at the power equations in the american alliance system apart from india i mean we are not an alliance partner but we are a partner apart from india as a strategic partner none of them of his uh, alliance partners have a credible military capacities capabilities not trade or 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 being a great influencer japan is trying to become one but japan and can at best will be a resource providing country japan is now being pushed by the united states to to play a more dominant role in its own security south korea remains on tender hooks is got a challenge from north korea it's got a challenge from uh, from uh, china i know it's it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it has a boundary with china so the question for the koreans is this that their state of play will have to be limited another element that we need to understand is this is that all these alliance partners of united states while they are strategic partners they are very strongly economically aligned to china and this economic alignment with china constrains their space strategic space of action so this is how the game is being played but for united states a strong india credible india which is if 2030 i'll just take the scenario 2030 2035 when we are the third largest economy when we have a strong naval capabilities we have strong long range missile systems we have uh, a credible uh, outreach both in south china sea as well as in the in in the persian gulf and west asia along the east coast of africa no nobody can play a role better than that of stabilizing indo pacific than us and this is this is the interest of the united states of looking at india as a stabilizing power no other country can play this role so for india in the next couple of years that is post 2024 june 
the important thing lies is consolidating its interest in West Asia, consolidating its interest in East Asia, maintaining a credible partnership with, uh, with United States, and last and most importantly, also maintain strong alignment of interest with Russia. Because Russia is an important player. Russia will also be a constraining influence to the Chinese. Russia will also be a strong resource provider, which we cannot overlook. And the fact of the matter is this, we like it or not, another 20 years down the line, we still will be dependent upon one way or the other, of the Russian systems and spare parts and other elements, including our strategic in arena. We have to recognize one thing. There is no country which has helped us in our strategic programs as much as Russia has done, including our space programs. So I think I'll stop here and I'll uh, ask the general to give me, I mean. Yes, sir. I think uh, you outlined what are India's imperatives to obtain a favorable balance in this entire setup, in the emerging setup. The first thing I think which you have highlighted is that 2024 will be a consequential year, which means that you have to consolidate your gains and ensure you don't slip back and continue with your rise through economic integration and your economic activity. And for that, we have to first keep our uh, neighborhood intact and our neighborhood aligned with us. If not aligned, at least not inimical to us, I think which is a very valid point. The second thing you said, our major interests now in 2024 will lie economically, energy point of view and XYZ in West Asia and Southeast Asia, which we need to focus on. But when you come to the global thing, what is emerging is very clear. China will be our constant adversary along with Pakistan. North Korea is too far away. It will not probably affect us also. We have no other choice but to go with USA because China being the main adversary, we have to go with USA. But in this entire construct, Iran and Russia are someone whom we can't ignore. In fact, both of them are, have, we have had very good traditional equations with them. And at no stage, should our actions put these equations at peril? While you have said that, you know, we depend on Russia for strategic purposes, energy purposes, resources, even technology, because a lot of our technology is Russia based. And we have very good equations with Russia. I think Iran is also an equally important player for us, whether to handle Afghanistan or to handle Pakistan, or also for the North-South transport corridor as and when it comes up. Right? And it also is the wedge which you can drive back to China and to Turkey, though Iran has its own way of looking at things. So these are the broad things which you have uh, think. So I think this is what the agenda is for 2024 and for the new government which comes into play. Right. I'll not ask you any questions. I just summarized what you said to put things in perspective to everyone, because we can keep debating upon this and uh, you know, continue with it. We'll probably have another session as to what should India's focus in the neighborhood be, and we'll split it into parts. Now, so, you know, Vishwa.